Good evening. Glad to have everyone here. Looks like it's starting to rain out there, so that's a good good thing. <laughs> or sprinkle anyway. We'll take anything we, that God will give us. Let's begin our song service this evening by singing, He's My King.
Christmas bow with me. And Father, bless the time that we're here this afternoon. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to, to assemble together. Father, have this opportunity to sing these songs of praise unto your name. Father, to hear your word proclaim to us. Father, pray your blessings to be upon those that, uh, Father, can't be here for one reason or another, and ask, Father, that your blessings to be upon them. Father, we are mindful of these listed in our bulletin for Jay Potts and to Lord Sutherland. Pray that your blessings be upon them. For Ernest and Judy Collins, for Keisha Curtis, T.J. Stevens, Becky Walker, and Chuck Sutter. Father, we just ask the Lord that you would, Father, be with them and bless them and, Father, restore them to the measure of health that, Father, they can be out and about and, and Father, sharing this time with us and others in their life from day to day. Father, we ask your blessings to be upon those that uh, we bring our message to us tonight. Pray, Father, that your blessings to be upon him. Father, we thank for this opportunity to come and to share this time together, to listen to the, your word being prepared to us. And, Father, that it might, Father, help us to grow in our spirit and our truth and our knowledge and understanding of you. Father, we ask that you would, uh, Father, bless the land. Father, we're thankful for the rain that we're getting at this very time. And, and Father, pray especially, Lord, that, uh, Father, that you bless those that make their living by the land. Father, we ask that you would, Father, leave, bless us as we leave this place later in this evening. And, Father, we could, Father, be Father, proponents of your word and encourage and bless others by the, the knowledge that we share with them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Fall. Before Kevin comes bring and brings the lesson to us, let's sing Faith is the Victory. Let's be standing. Encamp along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Again. 
against the flow in vales below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is a victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love. Sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Be seated. Preach the word, word, Kevin. Kinda. (laughs) I want to mention a couple of things uh, as we begin here this evening. Uh, Starting next week, we will be in a series on Sunday night. We're going to be looking at, okay, you got to turn around and look. Look at those windows. Doesn't that look good? And now I won't have your attention for the rest of the class, will I? It's like, like, why did I do that? (laughs) No, but in September, we're going to be looking at um, a short series out of the book of John from about John chapter 13 through 17 called Four Hours, One Thursday. Uh, Think about what took place in that upper room and in that evening. Think about all the things that Jesus said out of John. Think about him washing, washing their feet and then all those comments and all those and that prayer and everything else that had to do with those things that took place uh, on that evening before, uh, before the soldiers arrived. So we're going to be looking at about four weeks uh, and looking into those particular areas of study. If you'd like to go ahead and, and, and be ahead, uh, you can go ahead and start reading those chapters and be prepared for that. What I want to do tonight is to spend a little bit of time uh, talking to you a little bit about the trip that I had this summer and getting a chance to go to Israel for, for my second time. Um, it's, it's an amazing trip because of some of the things even that, that Todd mentioned in the song right there, faith is the victory. When, when Thomas says, I'm not going to believe unless I, can, you know, unless I can put my fingers where the hole is, put my hand where the side is, unless I can do that for myself... I'm not going to believe. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you because you see it, but blessed are those who have not seen still believe. But there is something that's pretty special still about being able to see some of these places for yourself, of standing where Jesus stood, of walking where he walked. And there are still some places that we are pretty certain in and around Jerusalem and some of the other places up around the Sea of Galilee where we're... 99.999999% sure Jesus would have walked through there. And so the opportunity for for me to go again, about uh, a group of about 50 of us, if you see in the picture there, traveled from Little Rock to Atlanta to New York City to Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And you're saying, that sounds like a long flight. Well, that was several flights in a row. Just the one flight from New York to Tel Aviv was 11 hours. Exactly. Boy, doesn't that sound like lots of fun. But... The opportunity for us to go was amazing. This particular picture, you see in the background, the, the Dome of the Rock or the, the Temple Dome. The, uh, and so you see that in the background. All of us, as we stood there, we are up on uh, the Mount of Olives. 
looking across. That's the Kidron Valley that you see below there and then the Temple Mount in the background as well. Monty and Beth Cox. Monty is the, the dean of the School of the Bible there at Harding. Uh, he's been doing this since about 2011. I think he's taken some 20 trips uh, over there, students, um, just different ones at different times. But he's been going to the Holy Lands for a long time. They were our hosts, and they do just an amazing job at that. This was our uh, tour guide. His name is Yossi Paz. Um, you will look at him right there and think, okay, no big deal, right? Well, he's an archaeologist. He is a competition-level flautist. That's, he plays the flute, right? Okay, that's just a nice way of saying it. He plays the flute. Um, he plays the mandolin. He knows music that has to do with the Greek culture, the Arabic culture, um, all of the other surrounding Mediterranean areas, those cultures as well. And so when we would go from place to place, he would play some type of music from that particular area to kind of get us in the mood if, if it wasn't enough just that we were there already, right? Joke teller, scholar, um, and so we I, I had the opportunity to visit with him again while we were there and lined him up. We're going to start taking trips starting next summer for our graduates here at SIBI. So we're going to start taking them uh, there. Um, some of you that are sitting in the audience are going to get, wait a minute, what about us? Well, we're going to start with graduates of the school and take some uh, some of the faculty with them, kind of their graduation present. Uh, and so we're looking forward to that. I'll get to lead that next year, Lord willing. I wanted to, I wanted to take you on a little journey. This doesn't even cover half of the places that we went, okay? I got 44 slides, and we're going to go through pretty quickly right here. But that doesn't even tell you half of the places that we went. But I'd love for you to walk with me uh, in some of these places where Jesus went and where he walked. You start the journey there in Nazareth. And think about a, a city at that particular time back in, in the first century where it might have been two or three hundred people. And that two or three hundred people, of course, a little bitty city, uh, think about him growing up there and the boyhood town of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, it says they came and resided in the city called Nazareth. Today, you'd look at it and say, I would guess that's a few more than just two or three hundred. Yeah, it's a city of some 77,000 now. Uh, it has uh, a university there. This particular picture is taken from up on what's called Mount Precipice where we stand here as well, looking across the Jezreel Valley. And this is called Mount Precipice. Well, I'll give you another picture of it maybe here in just a little bit. But in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30, it says that he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and he entered into the synagogue on the Sabbath. If you got your Bibles, you can find out one of the things that he read comes out of Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah chapter 61, he quotes this, or he speaks this, or he reads this from the scroll. This says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn. When you think about reading from that particular passage, you might think to yourselves, the people in Nazareth would have been excited, yes? All right, finally, Messiah's here. And then in just a couple of verses after that, it says, but you do know, don't you, that he didn't do very many miracles in that area. In fact, he, he went to all these other people around him that God took care of those folks. But he didn't really spend a lot of time with his own people, the Jews. And that's when they took him up on this large hill outside the city. What were they going to do with him? They were going to push him off the hill, yes? And it says that he moved through their midst, and none of that took place. But while he was speaking in the synagogue, it says they were filled with rage, and they led him to the brow of the hill. We got to go up on the hill and look all the way around it. You see the Jezreel Valley. You're going to see some pictures here in a little bit of some areas down further south, it doesn't look anything like this. 
you see crops and, you know, the, the cross patterns and everything that are in there. There are places down south where you couldn't have found a green leaf of grass anywhere. There was no such thing there. But this is a really fertile area right there where most of the growth for their area takes place. What Jesus do almost immediately when he starts his ministry? Around the Sea of Galilee, doesn't he? This is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, it says that he was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers there. Who were they? Simon and brother Andrew, and he found two others who were partners with him, James and John as well. And they were fishing, not fishing like we tend to do with our Zebco 303 out there. They were net fishing, right? Throwing it out and bringing all those back in. And Luke chapter 5 tells us that on one of those occasions, they brought back in such a catch that it began to break their nets. This was the first opportunity for them to see something of what Jesus could do for them as well. Because what did he tell them? From now on, I'm going to make you fishers of men, not fishers of fish. This particular shot is called the Jesus boat. Not because Jesus was ever on it. uh, No indication that that was ever the case. But in 1986, after a severe drought, the, the lake level there in the Sea of Galilee dropped significantly. And... Uh, Somebody was along the shore right there and found what looked like a piece of wood sticking out of the mud. And they began to dig a little bit and found more pieces, more slats of board that were there. But of course, it had been underwater for some 2,000 years. So what happens to wood when it's in water that long? It just turns to mush, right? Which is exactly what happened. In Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, you remember that it says that Jesus got into the boat and then he began to preach to the people who were there. Remember? And it's at that particular situation where he tells Simon to go back out and cast his nets on the other side. This particular boat, called the Jesus boat, again, was discovered in 86, but it comes from that particular era in the first century. And they were able to unearth it, took them... Uh, about a month to be able to get. It took them more than a month to figure out how they were going to get to it and get it up and get it out of there with all the stuff. They put uh, that spray stuff, you know, you put in the walls that to seal up cracks. Well, they put that all the way around it and, and held it in place and then finally was able to, to pick it up. Um, you'll see it, a couple of different shots of it right here. It's 27 foot long. It's seven and a half foot wide. Uh, More than 100 archaeologists and volunteers were a part of this project. You would want to be a part of that, too, if you had the opportunity, wouldn't you? And, and again, just all kinds of time to be able to actually get it out of the mud. Um, Nothing, again, to connect it with Jesus other than the fact that it would have come from the same era. The boats that Peter and Andrew and James and John would have used would have looked very much like this, probably in a little better shape than this one but still would have looked very similar to that. And that's Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You think about how often uh, boats played a part in the ministry of Jesus, right? So many different stories that we could tell. Well, when we got on this one, and this is not Noah's Ark. I know you see Noah on there. This is not the Ark, but this is one of the boats that was on the Sea of Galilee. We actually got to sail on the Sea of Galilee. And so we, been, we began to, to talk about those stories. What stories can you think of right off the top of your head? What do you do with the storm on the Sea of Galilee? Calm the storm? Yeah, peace be still. And he said it became completely calm, which would have been almost as eerie as the storm itself, wouldn't it? Or other situations that you can think of as well. Um, feeding of the 5,000 was at the, the edge of the lake. Um, wanting to withdraw but encountering crowds and following him and going to the other side and they meet him over there as well. Um, The demoniac on the far side, he goes to the eastern side over there to get away from the crowds. In Mark chapter 5 verses 1 through 20 talks about this fierce storm. He calms it. They immediately get to the other side. Remember, he's the storm's going on and he's walking on the water, scares them all to death. And immediately it says they get to the other side and here comes this demoniac, no clothes on, had been chained, 
cut everything else. I'm thinking to myself, if I'm Peter and Andrew, James and John, I'm telling everybody to get back in the boat. Hurry, hurry. Let's get back on the other side. This is, this is crazy. But the lepers are cleansed in Luke chapter 5. And all kinds of other stories in and around the side of the lake. When we were there, there was no fierce storm. There was no hush, be still, but we just cut the engine for a while and just enjoyed thinking and contemplating and considering all the different things that happen in this particular place. Up the hill from there is a place called the Mount of the Beatitudes. This particular picture has Monty actually giving us the Sermon on the Mount. All of it. He didn't read it. He spoke it as if in English. He didn't do it in Arabic, which was good because none of us speak Arabic. But he spoke the words in English to each one of us. And you notice in the background, that's the Sea of Galilee behind. And so as we stood there and listened to these words fill our ears and fill our hearts, then we get to see the, the Sea of Galilee behind as well, thinking of what it must have been like that first time they heard it. The first time, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are the me. And, and, and so on and so forth. Talking about all the things about what it's going to mean to be a follower of Jesus. What an amazing, amazing chance that was to get to, to be there and to hear those words spoken at that particular moment. Again, the mount of the Beatitudes, just a different shot. Um, it was a fairly good climb. There was not an easy way to get there, and so we went up close to um, a, a, a building that was up further up the hill and then walked down to this particular area to be able to, to sit and to enjoy and to, uh, just to get to hear these words. From there, we went around a little bit further to what's called Capernaum, and you may be able to see it. Yeah, I think you can probably see it says that, that Capernaum is the town of Jesus. You remember that that became his, his, his place of operation, his home afterwards. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 13, and then again in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1, says that he settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, and then in chapter 9, verse 1, that he came to his own hometown. Probably, if you read like most of us read, we find ourselves reading the stories without really thinking about the places where they took place. But you can imagine a lot of things taking place there. This is a strange kind of picture. You see all the old rocks underneath and this large uh, concrete, almost a, a pillar that's turned sideways there. That actually holds up a large Catholic church building over this particular area. This is the area they believe to be Peter's house in Capernaum. And the reason that they believe that it's right there is because just off to one side of this, and we'll, I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment, uh, was the synagogue. And Jesus was actually in the synagogue in Capernaum as well. In Luke chapter 4, verse 38, it says, He arose and left the synagogue, and he entered into Simon's house. You may look particular picture and think to yourself okay what's the deal with that well you can see the you can see the small sign here I've blown it up in in this this is called the late fourth century AD the white synagogue the white blocks which was probably there given during the Byzantine era which uh, mostly Romans but that particular white rock you can't see it for the shadows very well but the darker rock that's underneath that's the first century rock that the synagogue would have been built on so it's a place, again, that we can look at with pretty much certainty and know Jesus was here. Jesus was there, actually, in this particular place. Can you think of some places, some things that took place there in that city? This is some of the excavations of Capernaum. We said already that it's the home of the four fishermen, Peter and Andrew and James and John in Matthew chapter 4. It's the place where the centurion's servant was healed in Matthew chapter 8. Capernaum is the place where Jesus finds Matthew in the tax booth and calls him as well. It's the place where the nobleman's son is healed in John chapter 4. Capernaum is the place where 
the paralytic. You remember the story, right, where Jesus is preaching and they can't get to him, the four buddies? So what do they do? Yeah, they start tearing up the roof and start letting him down through the roof. Capernaum is where this took place. This is also the place where Jesus healed Jairus' daughter in Matthew chapter 9. So in all of these events, you remember that Capernaum was one of the towns that Jesus actually cursed. You remember? Because he said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had had the miracles done in them that you guys got to see, they would have repented. So it doesn't, even, because, even with all of the things that Jesus did for them, it's amazing to hear that Jesus looks at them and says, this is not a city of faith, that they don't want to follow after him. This is something that was just discovered, very recent discovery. In 2009, this is Migdal or Magdala. Can you think of a person who might have been from Magdala? Her name was Mary the Magdalene or Mary Magdalene from Magdala. They found it back in 2009. This is the outline of their synagogue. Again, not a place that Scripture tells us, but because it was on the road between several of those places, very likely a place that Jesus would have visited as well. And we know many, uh, many of the stories that Mary Magdalene was a part of in Jesus' ministry also. This is a place that we got to visit this time that we didn't get to visit in 2019. This particular place is called Kersey. And it is in the land of the Gadarenes. It's on the eastern side, and you can look at this, and there are hardly any cities over on the eastern side, hardly any. It still would look very much like it would have looked in the first century. The land of the Gadarenes, or the Gerasenes, east side of the Sea of Galilee, is where that demoniac was found. This is where they came ashore, was right there, and he came running towards them. You remember what he called himself? Jesus asked his name. Legion, for we are many. Yeah. What would it be like for this man? What all kind of voices would be going on in his head all the time? And so Jesus not only takes the demons out of this man and they find him clothed and in his right mind, remember? What happens to the demons? Sends them off into the pigs, remember? There was a herd of pigs out there on the fields grazing. Sends them off into the pigs. And what happened to the pigs? This is the area they believe to be the spot where they run off of the cliff down into the water. So again, places that aren't just made up. The story's not just made up. These are real places, and many of them are still visible today. Oh, and by the way, there was a little rest stop that we stayed at for a little bit and visited and talked about this. And we found this uh, mosaic of Jesus supposedly healing the demoniac here in this particular mosaic picture. We went a little further north. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus begins to ask his disciples some questions. He starts with this one. Who do people say that I am? Remember? Remember? And they said, well, some think you're a prophet, some maybe John the Baptist, um, some Elijah or Jeremiah or somebody else. And then he asks a second question to them, yes, but who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter confesses him to be the Christ. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. That happened in this particular area. Today it's called Banias. Then it was called Caesarea Philippi. It's further north. This area is called the Grotto, and it's the remains of the Temple of Augustus. Do you remember what Jesus said right after that confession of Peter? Yes, and upon this rock, upon this confession that I am the Christ, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. This particular grotto, this particular area right here has been traditionally called the mouth of hell. So when he speaks and when he says that, he may be standing in front of this particular area. Not even death and not even hell itself can stop what's about to take place. 
It can't stop what Jesus is going to do in building his church. Again, it's one of those places where you stand and kind of the hair on the back of your neck stands up a little bit because you're thinking about the promises that Jesus made in a very specific place. That's the grotto uh, there in Caesarea Philippi. We get a mount called Mount Tabor, and Mount Tabor is the traditional place for Jesus' transfiguration. Who did he take with him? Remember? Peter, James, and John, yes. And he took them up on a high hill, and he led them up there. But it's not just the three of them, because a couple of other guys decide to join the party, Yes. Elijah and Moses, yes. What would that conversation have been like? What would it have been like to have been in the know or in that small group with Peter and James and John? Well, Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, says that he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun. This is Jesus getting ready for that final push to Jerusalem. We think sometimes he's the son of God, so no big deal, right? And yet God provides for him the comfort and the encouragement that he needs is, that he needs in both Moses and Elijah. As he gets closer and closer to Jerusalem, this particular model that's found outside uh, there in Jerusalem itself, much of his latter ministry occurred around Jerusalem. This is a model of what first century Jerusalem would look at, uh, look like. You can see several parts of this. You can see the temple there. You can see the surrounding areas and the courts that would have been around there as well. Um, it, they said that this was about 140th the size of what Jerusalem would have actually been at the time. But you can see the people that, as we were looking at it and, and just, a, a, again, a good picture in your mind of what this might have looked like during the time of Jesus. These are some of the steps to the southern entrance. Many of the original stones still there. As you would come out the south entrance, you would take a, just a short left and you would go out to the Mount of Olives. Do you remember the last week or how many times that he would go every evening up to the Mount of Olives and then he would come back and he'd go in and he'd teach daily in the temple courts. So we got to sit there for a little while and we got to think about what about all those teachings? What about all the things that, that took place? Uh, what they would have remembered and what they would have been uh, privy to in all of those teachings. You see the different stones and the different stone colors, the very bottom, the, even the bigger ones. Uh, this is because over and over again Jerusalem has been conquered Walls have been pushed over and then rebuilt and then pushed over and then rebuilt. And so each time they would do that, you would have different kinds of stone to be able to build the wall back. But several times the wall has been breached by enemies and then later rebuilt. This is probably, if you've seen hardly any pictures of Jerusalem, you've probably seen this picture. This is called the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. Um, they say that the Wailing Wall is what Gentiles call it, but they don't call it that. They call it the Western Wall. This is the closest that the Jews can be to the original temple. And so every day there are a number of Jewish rabbis and priests that are there. And you've probably seen them as they, you know, they got their little book and they're, they're rocking back and forth. That's not so much wailing as we would hear it because you'll hear them speak. And that's why they said it's misnamed by us Gentiles. That's actually praying that the Messiah would come back. Because they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They don't believe he ever was. You see all these cracks in the wall? They go in there and they take little slips of paper and their prayers that they have written in them and they slide them in between these cracks right here because they believe that the, that the uh, emanation of God still comes out, the Shekinah glory comes out of the cracks of the wall still for these people. They don't understand that Jesus has already come and that when he comes the next time, it won't be to save them. And that's sad 
to watch them do this. We had the opportunity to see a couple of different things, stories that you're familiar with. This is called the Pool of Bethesda. You remember in John chapter 5, 1 through 18 talks about the man. There's the, the sheep gate and a pool, which is called Bethesda. A man who'd been lame for 38 years was there. And it said there's a multitude of, of sick, lame, blind, all kinds of other diseased people. But you remember when Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? And we would hear something like that and think, well, Jesus, that's, that's not very kind that you would even ask that. Of course he wants to get well. He's right here. But you can also imagine that he's been there so long that it feels like there's no hope. When he responds to Jesus, he says, when the waters are stirred, when they believed that was an angel that would stir the waters. But, but when the waters are stirred, somebody else gets in the water before me. But Jesus really does want to know, do you want to get well? Because he's not going to be healed by a pool. He's going to be healed by the Messiah. There's another pool that's fairly famous. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 11, it says that he saw a man born blind, since birth this is the pool of siloam one of the things that we did is actually had the opportunity to walk through the tunnel of hezekiah now if you're not aware of that you need to go back and look at chronicles and you need to go back when sennacherib was after hezekiah and everything that was going on in jerusalem they brought water in through this pool of siloam under the wall through this tunnel. They started at two different areas and met. That, that's not a God thing at all, is it? Right? No, none of the modern technologies that we have today, but they met in this place and they were able to bring fresh water. There is water still in this tunnel built 2,700 years ago. And we just happened to walk through the tunnel while we were there. This particular man went to the Pool of Siloam the blind man, and he came back seeing. He came back seeing. This shot of the Temple Mount, you remember that that last week of his life, he is teaching in the courts. He's teaching in the, in the temple all the time. In Matthew chapter 23, as he walks in for that, one of the last times that he'll ever be there, he cries, he weeps, he laments over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who speak to you. How I long to bring you like a, like a, a, a chicken, a hen brings her brood under her wings, but you would not. The parables that he spoke, the fig tree, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, all have to do with being ready for his return. This particular picture was taken from the Garden of Gethsemane, looking across to the Temple Mount. The Sunday that we were there, that Sunday afternoon, we went to the Garden of Gethsemane and had the Lord's Supper and a devotional time there. Pretty special. Thinking of what he did for us, what he did for me, pretty amazing time to be able to be there you remember while he was there he praised the prayer father is there another way is there not another way and we thought about the prayers and we thought about his agony and we thought about his resolve to do God's will over his own will and the betrayal by Judas and his arrest They had to take him to the high priest at the time, Caiaphas. These are the ruins of what they believe to be Caiaphas's house outside the city walls. You can see the city wall back over to the far right side. Caiaphas's house. This would have been the place where the most godless trial that's ever taken place took place. Caiaphas was the high priest that year. Just another picture of it. You can't see very well, but you can see kind of the foundation right here above it. This is what sits on top of that. It's called the Church of the Gaiukantu. Those of you who 
speak Spanish or may know a little bit of Latin, gallí or gallina. That's the rooster, yeah. Cantu or cantar in Spanish, where the rooster sang or crowed. This is the place they believe that Peter was when he denied his Lord three times. He was there close, but he didn't want to be too close, did he? They led Jesus to the fortress Antonio, what we know as the Praetorium. And each of the soldiers took their turn at him. The whole body brought him before Pilate. And then the guards took turns beating him and spitting on him and slapping him and doing everything they could to humiliate him before the cross. Matthew chapter 27, it says that they took Jesus into the praetorium. They gathered the whole Roman cohort around him, stripped him, spat on him, beat him, mocking him as well. We know that when they were finished, they put his robes back on him and they made him carry his own cross. This is called the Via Dolorosa, the way of pain or the path of pain. This is one of the stations that's still marked all along where he would have walked through Jerusalem carrying his own cross. This is called Gordon's Calvary because where the original Calvary was, there was a huge church there and they have taken away much of the stone and rock and everything else that would have been there. They wanted to take a piece of that for themselves. But this particular place gives us at least a little bit of an idea or a little bit of a picture of what it might have looked, at, uh, looked like. You remember John chapter 19? They took Jesus to the place of the skull. Golgotha, and they crucified him there. And after he died, John 20 and verse 41 says, there was a place where he was crucified, and in that place there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb. This is called the garden tomb. The British take care of it. None really believe this is the place where Jesus was placed, but in something very much that would look like this. And we had the opportunity to do just as these folks are doing right here, to look inside. In John chapter 19, it says, They bound the body of Jesus, as is the custom of the Jews, and they laid him there. We had the opportunity to look into the tomb as well. And as if we were listening to Scripture itself, we would have heard the same kind of thing. You remember what they said? Angels told them, What are you looking in here for? He's not here. He is risen. That's still true. Tomb's still empty. Tomb's still open. Mark 15 talks about that large rock that was placed in front of it. And in Luke chapter 24, the ladies are talking about it, but they ask, who's going to roll the stone away for us? But in Luke 24, it says when they got there, it was already rolled away and an angel sitting on top of it. I love that picture. I'm getting ready to speak right here. That's Monty uh, standing, but I'm getting ready to speak right here. They asked me to speak at the garden tomb. It was different this time. In 2019, I hadn't buried my mom yet. In 2019, my little sister hadn't passed yet. In 2019, Danny hadn't left yet. The resurrection means something different now. It's a place we're looking forward to. It's a time we're looking forward to that we'll get to be with them again. The resurrection isn't just a fanciful story. It's real. It's true. And it's a place we want to go as well. Like I said, I've got a whole lot more. But this just is a taste an opportunity for many of our students and some of our faculty go, to go as well. Some, some have asked in different settings, so I'm just going to mention it real quickly here. Some have asked, is, you know, is there something that we could do to help some of the students? Well, monthly support's always welcomed. But there are a couple of things that you could be a part of as well if you wanted to help them, those graduates, go. Uh, Sunset's going to take care of a chunk. 
the school itself, SIBI, will take care of a lot of that, but they've got to raise some of their money themselves so that they're invested in it as well. So if you've got uh, just some extra cash hanging around you don't know what to do with, I know that's always the case with us, right? But if there's that possibility and you want to help some of the students to get to be a part of this trip, uh, that would be wonderful as well. Just to mention, walking and following after Jesus, as Monty mentioned this morning, is the best thing in the world, isn't it? Getting to be his follower, getting to be a disciple of Jesus. But if you haven't made that determination, if you haven't decided for yourself to follow after him, before we leave, we want to sing a couple of verses just to invite you to be a follower, to be a disciple of Jesus as well. Won't you come while we stand and sing? To Christ be loyal and be true, his banner be unfurled. And Lord of all, till is secure the conquest of the world. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you.
Be safe out there and have a great week. You're dismissed. And stack the chairs.